Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and, and thanks Tom and uh, Simon for including me. I'm not specifically working with technology at the moment. I am working with uh, children who have a disability and working with community music. But the organisation I'm working with, um, Limelight Music, are in particularly what I would call techie. I'm hoping, we're hoping some of the learning that, um, that comes from this, um, one of the projects I'm going to talk about will inform um, an interactive website. And please do forgive the use of notes. I've had three presentations in the last two weeks about completely different things, so it's just to keep you in the straight and narrow. So I'm going to talk a lot about methods today. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of participatory and person-centered approaches to the situate the kind of work I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about two projects. Uh, one is with adults and the other is with young people. Two different projects. So the first one is um, actually an Edinburgh University project, um, which was um, from 2017 to 2019, funded by a European Social Innovation Fund named Music as Social Innovation, and I was a research fellow on this. <laughs> and we were looking at social impacts of community music. And the second project we're going to talk about with young people in is a kind of like really latest up-to-date um, data gathered last week from my British Academy Postdoc Fellowship. And this is investigating processes and outcomes, including well-being impacts of community music for young people with disabilities. And I'm looking both in mainstream and in special schools. So um, one aspect to pick up on is that um, both studies are with mixed groups, so uh, we have people with physical disabilities but also um, diff different types of things so all in together. So while there has been a movement to include people who use disability services and research to improve these services, they're often not fully recognised as equal to other stakeholders. And this failure to recognise people with disabilities can lead them to feeling dis diminished and that participation in future research and consultations isn't worth the personal cost. So ensuring transparency about the extent of power sharing possible um, can address this issue. And again, referring to Charlton, nothing about us without us is an early example of this activist research that pro has provided an often cited phrase and influenced approach to design. However, um, more investigation is needed into the nature of participation possible, and also the types of relationships the, to address the inevitable challenges as well as transformational purposes that might arise in such work. So <clears throat> combining person-centred and participatory approaches offer um, a way to investigate community music. People taking part, and especially in the settings I'm talking about, can have highly variable needs and means of expression. And so these two approaches I talk about, and because my background's um, mainly psychology and education, we kind of, um, there's a lot of work in health to do with participatory research, and person-centered approaches that actually come from kind of um, music therapy background. And there's many overlaps between these two areas, so I'll kind of synthesize these into one diagram for you. And the central triangle represents the overarching aims for participants, that they have agency, um, and a sense of belonging and it's important to have sort of flexible and inclusive ways in for people to participate and floating around these are the things that the researchers should be doing to um, ensure these things happen there needs to be a dialogue there needs to be reflexivity on the purpose and again we've talked about this a lot this morning that the crucial nature of building these relationships over time so that um, the creativity and um, problem-solving nature of this type of work can develop, but we can have room to fill to try again to, to improve. <clears throat> so this, this approach informed, has informed a couple of re research studies that came out of the Edinburgh University project I was talking about. And um, for this, we worked with two lay researchers uh, both with, the, with a disability, and we applied them to observe a workshop program alongside the research team. We gave them training in how to carry out interviews and um, to give feedback on thematic analysis. So traditionally, a key part of psychological research is guaranteeing anonymity for research participants. And this is also extended a lot to lay researchers and um, citizen researchers starting to see this a lot in participatory work. 
However, the assumption that this blanket anonymity is good for everybody has been challenged, um, including a researcher here called Maeve Moore, who's a sociologist. And she questions this. Is this right for every single occasion? Suggesting that this can be paternalistic. And people should make their own choices about how they're represented in research. So these two lay researchers pictured here were given the opportunity to remain anonymous, to choose their own pseudonym or to be named and they chose to be named, and here they are. Um, we produced two journal articles and a conference paper, and they all had different levels of contribution from, from our lay researchers. Um, for the first article, which is the top one, the understanding wellbeing effects, um, they read the paper, they made minor comments, and we acknowledged them at the end. So it's a kind of member checking, kind of standard psychological practice. Um, the conference paper was a quantitative study about increases in eye gaze that we appreciated through 360 de degree camera in the middle. And again, that was a kind of reading and commenting process. The article at the bottom um, was the most, uh, was the largest contribution. And this article was about um, the, the Limelight team who were delivering the workshops. Um, and Limelight um, always aimed to go out with a practitioner who has a disability themselves. So when we were um, doing an interview study with them, and so the motivation for including Kirsty and Michael Moore was that, guided by the focus of the article, um, we felt it was important, along with this kind of member checking we'd established, that our interpretation was informed by people with lived experience of disability. Um, and as they contributed to the conceptual development of themes and discussion, they were credited as co-authors in this journal article that was out in February. And I'll just outline, outline the process of research in the next slide. So, um, yeah, it was, I think, I suppose when I get to, I'm sort of working down, we get to the, the, the analysis bit was a real fun bit that happened and was probably the longest bit where you have the lay researchers doing their analysis, we did our analysis, we had lots of, we had sort of monthly Zoom meetings over um, a period of about six months where we were involved in this, this dialogue. And the paper actually took quite a long time to do. It was over a couple of years. But we feel that the results have um, really, the paper, we're kind of um, proud of the, the, the sort of rigor of the process and the depth that we had to go into I think it's necessary in this type of work. So moving to my next project, working with young people. So in addition to completing questionnaires by themselves or with help if required, young people are contributing to the research through participant-led focus groups. This actually, um, this, this came into being because I, I had a focus group with young people before we, we started going in with the, the series of workshops. And I got a very strong sense that um, the young people were kind of telling me what I wanted to hear. So I, I, in consultation with our teachers, I was like, how about I give them a little schedule, a kind of a brief outline of topics that it might be good to go into, and a recording device. So the data that I got from that was far richer and far more representative, I believe, of, of what they had to, to say. So this is something I'll be taking forward to the end of the project, which is next month. Um, interviews, there's quite a lot of um, literature interviews with people in, from vulnerable groups and ways around this. No matter how friendly you are, no matter how you want to put people at ease, you're still in a research situation and this, you, you can gain a particular type of discourse from a research interview. And I think when you're so interested as I am in trying to not capture subjective experiences, but understand the subjective experiences as well as, as well as I can. It's the, the, the sort of, how, how we go about this in the methods is very important. So some people have tried group interviews, for example, and, and various other things. So, um, and again, reading more and becoming more interested in arts-based methods, which are also super fashionable right now, and there's indeed some interesting work happening in Edinburgh University with Vinkstop, who are looking at arts-based me arts methodologies. Um, I decided to include these as a kind of way of stimulating conversation in the group. So, this where I talk about the pictures, um, an important part and, and relevant for this arts-based lens is that the young people knew me, know me. I took an ethnographic approach to this research. Before I, um, the music workshop started, 
I went into the school and I was a classroom assistant for a month. I would go in one day a week and get to know people and just help. Um, so I've been at three quarters of the workshops, I've been in a corner writing away on my workshop, in my kind of uh, field notes, but I've also been singing, handing instruments out and sometimes jumping into help on bass guitar because that's what I play. For the um, arts methodology, I brought an art practitioner um, to, to, you know, to do an art class, but we kind of framed it so that they were to be inspired by the music work they'd done. But in kind of um, setting the situation up, I had the young people try to explain, or to, uh, I tried to have them explain to Brian what um, they were doing in the music workshops. And actually for, for this, before I knew it, they were falling over themselves to tell him what they've been doing. And that led into the, the creation of these works. Um, yeah, so Brian's a very experienced community artist. He uh, does a lot of work with Scottish Ballet and participatory um, arts in general. And he talks about giving invitations to people. And in, important in arts-based methodologies is being responsive and not directive. So we had started off saying, can we make a picture about emotions or music? And almost straight away, the young people were asking to make artwork for their song that they'd made or to do other things. And this is fine. I also recorded the conversations that took part. I'm more interested in the process of making rather than the outcomes, so I actually really love the outcomes and they're very like graphic scores to me. And so um, the talk demonstrates different ways of a musical engagement. Um, getting into some musical identity with the young people drawing themselves in the middle of a picture, for example. You know, some about feelings and some appearing quite abstract. So as I said, I'm at the beginning of my journey with analysis, I kind of got got these pictures last week, but um, I think it's really interesting parallel between music and art is that they're able to personalise it. They're taking part in a group activity, but everyone is able to um, contribute and participate in a way that's meaningful to them. So, um, thinking about research processes, um, I think they're necessarily emergent. Where one decision is informed by the ones you've made before. They're informed by collaboration and the context. And this needs a, you know, flexible study designs. It's not great for funding applications, though. But, <laughs> you know, and I was able to make this a part of my postdoctoral research because I had everything I needed as well. Because I, I use mixed methods. So I had this, and I was able to score a little bit of extra funding to bring Brian in. And, and do some a little bit of arts-based research that what you know that nothing else of my my that sort of affect my other methods, but it, I think it just really offers a kind of very rich picture and, and just another way of understanding. And like I say, that's a, the sort of challenge, a constant challenge, is finding all these different angles, not necessarily to to, to make one um, picture of, of how the children participated. You know, mixed methods are traditionally say well one. You know, um, qualitative work um, fills the gaps of quantitative work, um, or, or you know, offers a different perspective. And I think the kind of relationship of the art space stuff is not necessarily to fill a gap, but um, to think more of a kind of um, meta modern perspective on um, analysing it, where you have multiple realities that are true at different times. You know, and um, I think the, the capturing the the, um, the way the children processed and talked about the music in a way is, is another valuable um, way of doing it. And thinking about writing up, which is far in the future, but I'm, I'm very um, committed to taking that um, collaborative approach forward, so I would like to do something with Brian, possibly with the teachers, um, with the children. Um, yes, I'm thinking about it, so you know, watch this space. So I think that's probably all. Um, yeah, the last point is mosaic, so that kind of gives you the idea. It is a, it is a methodology of taking lots of little bits together. Um, use a lot of um, children, um, and nursery children, young children, but um, certainly has an application in the work I'm doing here. Thank you. Perfectly, Rana Thank you. <laughs>